The Bible says, let them grow together until the harvest. At the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather them up to wheat into my barn. Now, I can go to any Protestant church today and they'll explain to me what this parable is. It's clear, right? Why parables then? Now, we understand this also. The disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered said to them, because there's... It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So I propose a question to you. If this is true, then it should be true now. It's for them not to know. So now we have our paradox here. He it seems like he has given us the clear, concrete answer to what the parables are, yet at the same time he's telling us it's for them not to know. So what I'm submitting to you today is that in that parable, that what God has given is a clear understanding of good and bad, leave them to dwell together until the fire. What I'm telling you today that there are paradigms in the Bible back in the Old Testament that goes into the understanding of exactly who the wheat and the tares are for our lifetime. It's not just a parable, but you will find that the parables in this chapter can go back to and you can find the actual paradigm or the story of what these parables came from. And that has not been revealed to the rest of the world. And I'm going to share that with you today. Now look, what, let's go back now. Let's build a foundation about what I'm trying to tell you here. Philippians 2.5 says this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, nobody is telling us that if we want to understand what Jesus has to say in that parable, we've got to think like he thinks. We can't think our way. Isaiah 55, 8 says from the NIV, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So no matter what we do, if we think we know what he's saying, we don't unless we think like he does. So we've got to get into his mindset. That means we have to have his seed, not Satan's, to be able to go back into our minds to think like Christ has, so that we can understand what he said to us. There's a deeper difference that hasn't been understood. It is hidden because of the change in language. Jesus says he was a Hebrew. He is the word, both in the Old and the New Testaments. So there are things that were spoken in Hebrew that understanding has not been translated into English, but on the surface. The Old Testament was recorded in Hebrew. Now, I want to give you a little, little thing here. I'm going to put this disclaimer out. I, I, I want to say this because people say, well, where are we going with this? I don't need to be a physical Hebrew to think like Christ. You understand what I'm saying here? All right, I don't have to be. In other words, when I go look at the Old Testament and I say, what does this word mean? What is, what is being written for us? What's being recorded here? I don't have to wear a robe, a grow a beard, and wear tassels to understand what that word means, is what I'm trying to tell you. In fact, the Bible gives us a warning. It says, but it is not the word of God has been taken of no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel. And in the mixed God and zeal to get closer to God, many people feel like if you want to understand the past, you have to become messianic in nature, and how you look and how you approach things in addition to what you think. And the Bible is saying you don't need to do that. He goes on to say, For they are not all the children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac shall your seed be called. That is, those that are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. So you can do everything in the world to become exactly like a Hebrew was back in the Old Testament. Everything. And God's trying to say it's the children of the promise who are counted as what? The seed. The seed of God. See, it's the thought, the mind process, and the heart that God's looking for. It isn't because I have to walk the same way they did. I don't have to have all the physical in, uh, attributes that they did to make me the seed of God. What has to be done is the conversion of the heart and the mind of Christ. The Spirit of God makes me the seed of Israel, of God. And did, did that make sense? I wanted to clarify that because when you go into some of these things, when I've talked to other people in the past, next thing you know, they're out saying that I've got to be this way, I've got to do this, I've got to walk that way, I've got to wear this kind of clothing. It's like, no, I don't. And I'm trying to explain that. However, what I do know, I have to have the mind of Christ because that's what the Bible tells me. All right, now let's move on. Hebrew thinking versus 
Western thinking. Now, here's the difference why I tell you we miss what the Bible has. And this is part of the reason why. Let me go through a few steps with you. Hebrew thinking is concrete. Western thinking is abstract. Psalm 1 says this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So it's concrete. It tells you. If you walk in the counsel of... Uh, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He says... He shall be a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in season, concrete. You walk this way, you will be blessed like that tree. There's, not, no, there's no, no misunderstanding that. Or, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which drives the wind away. Now, God's concrete in what he says. Deuteronomy 28 is very clear. You, you follow God's way, you will be blessed. You don't, you will be cursed. Concrete. Abstract is general. The tree is, I just put an example, and you can pull up whatever example you want to. The tree is very large. Well, very large is very, it's abstract. It's vague. How big is large? You know, so, so there's certain ways that the English language is not concrete like Hebrew. Hebrew thinking is cylindrical in creationism. For example, God shows us that at the beginning, mankind was created. From that time on, there's cycles. You have your weekly holy days, the weekly Sabbaths. You have the holy days. You have your seasons. All things revolve around coming back to God's plan. Whereas, Western thinking is linear or evolutionary. Now, even though we have a year, the thinking is that mankind came from what evolution? It started somewhere and began evolving it didn't get a starting point, and it's not a cycle of creation. In other words, we are still evolving, is what man's Western thinking is. Two types, you have evolutionary, the evolution is you have physical and theological. Now, I don't know if you thought about this before, but today, Christianity is an evolutionary thought. It is, because you see, today, we say that the Old Testament is no longer in effect. It started here, it went to this point with the Israelites, it was fulfilled in Christ, now we've moved on to this. It is evolving as it moves. God says, I change not. Now, you see the difference? I mean, when you go through these things, there's huge amounts of change that we miss because we don't understand the language. Hebrew language is verb oriented. It means to do something. When God focuses on us, he doesn't focus on certain things. Like the, like the new the language today where we're like nouns and people, it focuses on action. It's a verb. It means to do. When, when God says something, it means there's something that's in, in, a, in action. It's a verb oriented, whereas Western thinking is noun oriented, like people, places, and things. Let me give you a couple of examples. Open block logic. Now, Hebrew, Hebrew, and this is where so many people today get so confused, and I listen to, I get, I get blessed to hear a lot of different things. And I say blessed sometimes, it's not being blessed. It's like, they drive me crazy. But I hear things, and people will look into the Hebrew and say, oh, well, this is what it means. And someone else on the other side of the argument will say, no, no, this is what it means. And in reality, they're both saying something different, and it could both mean that at the same time. And you have probably found that out when you studied Scripture. When you will study a Scripture in a specific subject, it will bring you to a Scripture. Months later, you'll be studying another subject, it brings you back to that same Scripture. Two different things going back to the same purpose from the same scripture, and they're both correct. It's called open block logic. And that's where you need to keep your mind open when you hear somebody say, well, this is what the Hebrew means. It sometimes has many meanings. It doesn't have just one. Open block logic means more than one meaning. Whereas is Western thinking is inductive and deductive. Because it says something, therefore it must mean this. They deduct what it really means. It's, it selects one meaning from, from a phrase. And everyone else's is wrong. <laughs> you ever notice that? My mother-in-law used to say, everybody's ent entitled to my opinion. <laughs> I love that. I heard it first. Said, everybody's entitled to my opinion. Therefore, if my opinion is right, deductively yours is wrong. Right? And, and, and that's the way the thinking goes. Now, Hebrew thinking deals with function Function, what it does, whereas Western thinking deals with form. You know, and that means like what it looks like. Let me give you a couple of examples. A pencil. 